Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, a couple of my introduction slides. As my dog starts parking, right? You know, of course I'm gonna start presenting. Um, all right, so, uh, which does remind me, before I say that, let me actually start the recording. That's uh, all right, it's recording on Twitch. So uh, this is being recorded, so if you speak up, you will be on the recording, just a, oh, just a uh, heads up on that. Um, of course, if you're on Twitch, you're not, your voice won't be recorded, because you can't. All right, so thanks to our sponsors. Oh, I need to change this logo. We have a new logo. Uh, so Green Events Technology, which is my little company that I run all the stuff under, technically pays for all this. All right, so some other uh, meetups to note. Um, I, actually, I think most everyone on the call also uh, attends Louisville.net meetups. We have a lot of fun with those. Those are usually the third Thursday of the month. Um, uh, next month, we'll have uh, Jay Harris talking about, uh, uh, what was the title of that talk? It was something about like, no anxiety with doing databases. Um, I know I, that's not exactly what the title was, but uh, Jay's awesome. So yeah, so that'd be a great talk. Um, and in August, uh, August, trying to figure that out because actually our normal third Thursday is Copalooza week. So, uh, but I think we're going to have a, a, a differently scheduled Google.net. And then in, uh, September, we have Mads Torgerson joining us, uh, which if you don't know that name, he is the one who is in charge of C-sharp and has all the ideas about C-sharp. So that's going to be a great talk. Um, and, and sure enough, He's really hoping for a lot of questions. Um, he, he's going to have prepared sessions, but you know, he really he wants to a answer a lot of questions. Um, so that's the schedule for that. Sure enough, for Louisville Azure uh, next month, we will have uh, uh, Michael Crump. Um, I have um, I actually just got the details about two hours ago. Well, I haven't put it up on, on Meetup site yet, uh, but that will be a great talk in August. Actually, we're going to have Jay Harris talking again, uh, but for the Azure group. Um, and that will be about Azure DevOps. And then I don't have anything scheduled yet for September on that. Uh, so definitely those groups. If you are a tech leader, uh, um, I you know, highly recommend our tech leaders uh, meetup group. We meet, uh, we're only meeting one, we normally meet a couple times a month, but we decide just to do the once a month right now. So second Tuesday of the month at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, we have our coffee and discussions. Um, of course, coffee's on you now uh, until we can go back and, and meet a person. But this is just a, it's just a group think, pair, share, you know, uh, talk about, no pairing, but, you know, bring the idea, you know, things that are going on in your teams. Uh, and it, this is a self-help, you know, so, well, you know, getting help from each other. Um, and you don't have to be from Louisville. One of the great parts about uh, everything being virtual right now, while it's the name of the group, you know, uh, you happily welcome everyone, anyone else. And then we have our IT happy hour, uh, which we are doing virtually right now. Um, and those are generally the second Tuesday of the month in the evening at uh, six o'clock, we start those at. Just some, some groups to, to be aware of. Of course, you know, I run Copalooza. Um, please think about coming to Copalooza. Excuse me, I just finished three hours of talking, so I'm, I'm a little bit parched. Um, you know, the great part about the, uh, because of the pandemic, it's all online, you know, so your ticket, you'll have access to everything um, to include access to most of the recordings. I, I keep on needing, should not still say all. Um, there are two or three sessions that won't be recorded uh, for copyright reasons and such, but, uh, or licensing reason really. Um, but uh, you're gonna have access to all that. You're gonna have access to recordings afterwards. Uh, we are gonna have open space. So the whole idea of, you know, you can talk, you know, a topic you want to talk about, uh, so you can put it up and there will be other people. Um, I love open spaces. There, there are conferences that I'm speaking at and that's, I spend all my time in open space if I'm not speaking, right? I mean, so I really love those. There is, you still gonna be have uh, the ability to do networking. You're still gonna be able to meet our exhibitors. Um, although, as I mentioned at the moment, all we have is, uh, 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 I've drawn blank the name of the company. Uh, uh -huh. Software Guild? Software Guild. Burning House? <laughs> Software Guild, yes. Well, technically it's Wiley, but yes. that's where the check comes from. <laughs> yep. 
it's but, a parent uh, company. But yeah, we will have more sponsors. We're working on it. And then assuming we get 500 paid attendees, and, and there is a magical number there that we're going to have attendee t-shirts uh, uh, that will be mailed out to you. Uh, so Sarah can relate to this, you know, kind of the, the uh, Star Trek style. Yeah. Um, and it, I, I wish it was cheaper, uh, but it's $150. Um, that really is what it costs to run this event. You know, um, you know, now with it being said, you know, what we've said, if we get enough sponsorships, we, we're going to refund people money, right? Because um, that was actually based upon no one other than Software Guild sponsoring us. All right. Uh, so sure enough, we're, we're streaming right now, but, you know, I stream every day uh, at 1130 um, on, at, uh, on Twitch. And the channel is called Tail Learn Code, uh, which you can see, you know, we're, we're tales about software development. We're, we're learning from each other. Uh, it, it really, it really is that. I, you know, uh, every once in a while, I get comments on the Twitch of, hey, you know, hey, stupid, this is the way how you should be doing that better, right? Uh, and then we're writing a whole lot of code, right? Uh, so that, that's always a lot of fun. Uh, let's say, you know, check it out sometime. It, um, you, you, you don't have to be, you don't have to have an account with Twitch, right? You, you, you just go there. Um, and you can go to tailorandcode.tv and that'll just redirect you right to um, to the Twitch channel. So that's always a lot of fun. Oh, I still have animations in here. Um, along with that, we are interviewing uh, uh, speakers. So Coppola's speakers, we're, we're in the middle of an interview series. Uh, this has been a lot of fun, right? Um, as you can see, I have, a, I have a full load of folks and I know more coming. Um, I was talking to Phil Dupisky Today and he's gonna, you know, he's gonna be, you know, adding his name to all this, um, and I know a couple others are gonna be adding this. So he's been a ton of fun. Um, they're around an hour long. Uh, we stream them on Twitch. We then send over the recordings over to uh, YouTube. Uh, they're available there 24 hours afterwards because uh, I'm a Twitch affiliate. That's the rules. You can't uh, can't uh, have it anywhere else for 24 hours. But uh, you know, so this is a great way to to meet the speakers, see who they are. Uh, you know, um, and also get an idea of what they're going to talk about because we, we, that's part of what we talk about during those interviews. All right, and I'm pretty sure this is my final slide. Um, so we will stick on, you know, for those who, who want, we have our after party afterwards. Um, so that's always a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and uh, um, it's completely optional. I will say we, 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 we turn off Twitch, right? We turn off the recording. Uh, so it's it's free, you know, free to speak whatever you want to say. All right, so now we're we're on the part where I get to introduce uh, uh, Sarah. I'm not even going to try to pronounce her last name. There's a reason why she goes by Suzuki. <laughs> I mean, and it's actually the point. If you're actually in groups of user of speakers, you'll never hear the name Sarah. It's just Suzuki. Oh. <laughs> to make matters worse, if we go to conferences in person again, if you call for me in the hallways and you just yell for Sarah, I don't answer. <laughs> you have to call for Saduki. <laughs> and you're right. I'm Saduki for a reason. The saw is for Sarah, the dookie is for Dukevich. So when my husband and I were in college, we were in an even group of people trying to figure out where to go up for dinner, and the vote was split down the line. And so our friend Pete said the Saduki counts as one vote. And I'm like, wait, what did you say? And then, so we got the couple name of the Saduki. Well, when we got married many, many moons ago, I asked my husband, can I just take the Saduki nickname? And he's like, yeah, sure. And so I've been Saduki ever since. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, to, uh, to Saduki. All right, let me go ahead and share it. And as you all have questions, please post it in the Zoom chat, post it in the Twitch chat, and I will do what I can to answer the questions. Um, as I tell people, try to ask the questions when I have it up. That way we have the context. All right, everybody hear me okay? Everybody see the Data Adventures with Azure Notebooks? All right, let's do this. So as Chad said, my name is Sarah Dukevich, also known as Saduki. And I'm going to take you guys on some data adventures with Azure Notebooks. Um, before we get too carried away, I want to say thank you to you guys for the opportunity to speak. And thank you to Project Jupyter and to Azure Notebooks for giving me something cool to talk about. Uh, I've been excited about this for quite a while. I have a friend of mine down in Columbus, Brian Sherwin, who did a talk at CodeMash many years ago about drops of Jupyter in her hair playing off of the, the song. 
but it was all about Jupiter notebooks. And I saw that and I thought, this is the coolest thing ever. Um, so we're gonna learn tonight about Project Jupiter and Jupiter notebooks. What are those? They're the underlying technology. And we'll look at Azure notebooks as well. So our goal tonight, we wanna to take a look at what is Project Jupiter? Because that is, like I said, that's part of the underlying technology and underlying story. And then what is Jupyter Notebook? How does that come into play? We'll look at what languages are supported by the notebook platform, where can that be run and how to use it. Then we'll look at what is Azure Notebooks, what languages it supports natively, how do you run that? And then we'll talk about pandas as well. Rest assured, there are no cute, cuddly pandas that are hurt in this presentation. So what is Project Jupiter? And what is Jupiter Notebook? People have heard Project Jupiter, the, the name, and they've heard Jupiter Notebook, and they think it's an interchangeable thing. And then they can get confused because it isn't. So what, what are the differences? So I tell people Project Jupiter, think of it as it's the organization, it's the people behind, it's the project behind the product. The product is Jupyter Notebook. So it's the thing you use to do stuff. Now let's clarify all of that. So Project Jupyter, they deal with open source software, they deal with open standards and services. They are the ones who created Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook, you'll see tonight, allows us to do many things, from working on learning a new language, perhaps, to are any of you teachers? If you're a teacher of some sort, maybe you're teaching junior dev something, maybe you're learning on your own from a learning experience, we can use it for that. Anybody analyzing data, perhaps 50 million records of data? <laughs> um, but analyzing data and presenting data findings as well. Now, I'm going to start uh, with the disclaimer of, I don't have a 50 million record data set. Chad mentioned it earlier in his, in his stream, so I had to bring that up. Um, the biggest data set I've worked with on this has been 2.3 million records and it's slow. So Azure Notebooks um, is a public preview and they don't recommend it for production. Don't use it for super large data sets. Jupyter, on the other hand, you can run locally. All right, so Project Jupyter. This came out of the IPython project. So the IPython project allows for interactive Python. Um, and they actually came out of the IPython project in 2014. It's 100% open source, open source software and it's free to use. And they did it under a modified BSD license so it was easily adoptable for, for people. The name Jupyter comes from three different languages that they support. So initially they were supporting Julia, Python, and R. They also did a play on it being a tribute to Galileo's notebooks about Jupiter's moons. So the name Jupiter kind of has a story between languages and science. You're gonna see that Jupiter notebooks are used in science and math and programming for sure. Okay. So Project Jupiter is the organization behind all of this. Jupyter Notebooks, are the, it's, they're the product. Jupyter Notebooks Singular is a product name. Notebooks is a collection of them. Um, to give you more backstory on this, so I've been using Jupyter Notebooks now for a few years. Um, I do a lot of data science studies with R or Python. Uh, went through, there's a website called Data Camp. They have an R track and a Python uh, track. So I went through both of those, just sharpening my skills. Because at the end of 2017, I had moved on from the position that I was in. I went back to freelancing and wanted to make sure my skills stayed sharp. Um, so I used DataCamp to get back up on R and Python. And I used Jupyter Notebooks to take those notes. So it was handy for stuff like that. Well, this experiment that you see here up on the screen gives you a sneak peek of what Jupyter Notebooks is about. So what you see here is you see this, let us start by reading that text. That's Markdown. So Jupyter Notebooks allows us to use Markdown to display plain text. You can do formatting, you can make it bold. Now this is a screenshot, so I can't really change it for this, but I could say this screenshot below is a sample of Jupyter Notebooks. 
Yes, you see me editing the slide in the middle of the presentation. Not your normal slideshow. That's marked down. Yeah, I just edited the slide in here because this is an Azure notebook that I'm presenting from. We'll show you more about that later as well. But what's nice is you can see that we have Markdown. We have what they call code cells. Those are the two main cells that we're going to focus on, code cells and Markdown cells. There are a couple others, but I don't get into those just because these two are the most common. Now, you're going to see in this screenshot that there's like in 150 and out 150. These code cells, so the in is the input to what they call the kernel, which is responsible for the language support. And the out is what the kernel is outputting. The 150, in this case, that's just the line number. It's pointing at in has all this code, out has this output. You can put code in a code cell that doesn't have an output, and that's perfectly acceptable. If, let's say that this was, I stopped this code cell at PD read CSV. Uh, I kind of can't highlight that in a picture. But let's say that's where I broke it. There would be no output. But if on the next line I did the color's head, that would be 151. And color's head's output would be out 151. So this number will always match the input that it belongs with. And this particular sample is from a, a, a thing from Data Camp, an exercise called Exploring the 67 Years of LIGO. This is just a small piece of what I did to go through that exercise, and that was just to sharpen my skills. All right, so Jupyter Notebooks, like I mentioned, they're good for learning, they're good for teaching, they're good for presenting, they're good for presenting because like this. Uh, I can actually bold this too. Again, showing you that I can edit the cell while presenting. Now, if I wanted to do codes, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. It depends on how the kernel is. So that's why I'm not going to show that, unfortunately, tonight, because the, the kernels have not been cooperating. OK, so language support. What is this kernel I keep mentioning? So think about like how in, like a Linux system has an underlying kernel. The, it's the support underneath. In the Jupyter Notebook realm, the thing that offers a language support is called a kernel. Python is the first language if you install Jupyter Notebook right out of the box. This is what it will show you. Other languages that are supported by other kernels, there are a ton. So this slide deck that I have here, you will be able to actually download this whole project. Um, think of it. So how many of you use GitHub and are cloning repositories? And projects. You understand that concept. You can do the same with these Azure Notebooks. You can clone projects so that you have your own copy of the Azure Notebook. But there's a list of kernels, and I'll show you what that looks like. The Jupyter documentation, and then later on the Azure Notebook documentation is super handy to have, uh, very well organized. I'm going to go ahead and click this list of available kernels. That way you can see just what languages are supported. I'll tell you, you're familiar with R, another data science kind of language. R is there. There's Julia, which was part of the naming. There's C Sharp, JavaScript, Ruby, TypeScript. There's various math packages and science packages. There's Go, Scala, Elixir. There's even Perl which having my regex roots in Perl, I was excited to see that. There is PHP, for those who keep picking on PHP, rest assured, you can still learn how to do it properly. Um, there's PowerShell, there's even Fortran in here, in this list. I've looked at this list a few times, and when I saw Fortran, I'm like, even the older languages can be taught in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, F Sharp, so Christopher Biles was asking if F Sharp is supported. If it's not on this list, it is definitely supported on the Azure Notebook side. So we, we'll, I'll show you that when we get into the Azure Notebooks and creating it. OK. Let's go back to the slides. There we 
we go. Okay. So yes, various languages are supported. F sharp, I don't remember seeing it in the official Jupyter kernels list, but it is supported in Azure notebooks. Um, if you want to test it out, um, we'll, I'll talk about that. Now, Jupyter Notebooks, again, this is the underlying technology. You can run this on your machine. So I'm going to go ahead and open up on my machine, and I'm going to bring it over here so you can see this. So there's data science and package management tools called Anaconda and Miniconda. Miniconda is much smaller. Anaconda is about 3 gig in size. And Jupyter Notebook is something that's part of that. OK. Just so you can see what the underlying technology looks like. Oops. Notebook. I'm going to go ahead and start Jupyter Notebook so you can see what it looks like. So installing Jupyter Notebook, you follow the installation instructions on their website, on the Jupyter website, and it starts out fairly simple. I'm going to pull it open it in another browser. So we'll pull that browser window over. And what you see here is my file structure. So whatever folder structure I'm in on my prompt is what's going to open here in this file system. So if I were to say, I want to look at my documents. And I want to come over to the far right and tell it new. To create a new Jupyter notebook, I'm going to click on new. And on this machine, I only have the Python kernels installed. I have another laptop here at home where I have a PowerShell kernel installed. Don't ask me what's on it, though. It's been a while since I've used the PowerShell kernel. But the Python kernel in Jupyter itself on my machine is Python 3, also has Python 3.7.5, 64-bit. Um, on Azure Notebooks, we will see Python 3.6, Python 3.5, Python 2.7. And I will warn you about Python 2.7 when I show you that on the Azure Notebook side. But I can create a, no a notebook here. And I'll show you what this looks like locally, just so you can see that I can create it. When you start Jupyter and create a notebook, it'll give it the name of Untitled. If you click up where the name is of Untitled, you can rename it. So I will call this the Louisville Azure demo. And tell it to rename. And if you see me looking sideways when I type those things, it's because I have my monitor to my right. So rest assured I'm not looking at some weird script. I'm actually looking at the monitor I'm sharing with you all. Now, what's nice about this interface is that I can see a bunch of things. I can see that I'm using Python. You can see in the upper right corner, you can see Python 3. That's the kernel I'm running. The Python logo, so that's another visual cue. The first cell that it starts, so these are the cells that will appear here. This is a code cell. Remember the in and out screenshot I showed you? Being Python, being programmers, one of the first things we do is make sure the interpreter is actually giving us a response. Now, I can press Control-Enter. I press Control-Enter. You should see my in is 2 plus 2, my out is 4. The interpreter is working. It can do math. Hooray for basic math. <laughs> um, but what's nice with Python 2 is I can say, OK, insert. I'm going to insert a cell below. And I'm going to type import this. Now, anybody watching currently, are any of you working with Python? Are you familiar with Python? I see some nods. So if you aren't familiar with Python, this command is going to give you some insight about Python and the way you write code and what to expect when you're looking at Python code. So if I go ahead and I'm going to press um, Shift Enter. Shift Enter will run the cell, and then it'll select below. Since there is no cell below, it'll create a cell for me. So this Zen of Python is a poem about the Python code and what to expect. And, and Tim Peters is a Pythoneer. He's a pioneer in the Python community. Python is a technical term for them. Um, and if you're a Python programmer, you're a Pythonista, 
of various terms that they have. But this is just to show you that this is an interactive prompt. And of course, we could do the, the print hello world. So we said hello world. That would be polite, I suppose. OK. But this is the basics. Now, let's say that I want to save my changes. Uh, maybe I don't want to save my changes. I have some unsaved changes. You can see that up here at the top. So next to the notebook name, it says last checkpoint was three minutes ago. Jupyter Notebooks, when you save it, also creates a checkpoint as a, stop, a stopping point for you to revert back to if you need to. So I'm going to go ahead and say file, revert to checkpoint, and take me to that last checkpoint. And it's going, are you really sure you want to do this? This cannot be undone. There's no control Z with the checkpoints. So once you revert, you can't go back to what you had before that. I reverted, everything is gone. So I saved this notebook when I first created it, but I didn't save anything in between. I can't undo my work that I just lost. I have to recreate it. But if you find yourself in a spot where you're writing a lot of code, or maybe you're writing a lot of markdown, and you're like, oh, I just said a bunch of stuff that I really don't want to, you can revert to the last save point. Any questions so far? OK. I'm going to go ahead and close this one. And I'm going to go ahead and close this. I need to press Control C to stop my local Jupiter. And I'll exit out of there politely. And we should be back at the presentations. OK. So extensions. So Jupyter Notebook by itself, you can do that interactivity that you saw on my machine. Extensions allows us to do more things in Jupyter. So we can do things such as prettifying code, making it look nicer. Um, we can do things like auto grading. So you can actually set up coding exercises for teaching others. And you also could set up a grading uh, tool to do the auto grading for you. I'm just now getting into those because I'm in that kind of situation now. Um, there are things that add snippets, variable inspectors. So those of us who like to debug, the inspectors help a ton with that. And then there's a slideshow extension, the Rise Slideshow. That's how I'm able to edit this, is I'm using the Rise Slideshow functionality that comes in Azure Notebooks. OK, so let's talk about Azure Notebooks. So why would we want to use Azure Notebooks? Well, Azure Notebooks are cloud-hosted Jupyter Notebooks. Um, what's nice is it's great for presentations like this one. Uh, it's great for learning new things and taking notes. Interactive languages, so Azure Notebooks currently supports Python, R, and F Sharp. However, this Jupyter technology and these notebooks are starting to appear in other things too, like Azure ML. Um, you're starting to see it for Q Sharp and quantum computing. Uh, SQL has some similar things going on as well. So this is a new thing that's really picking up. And it's good for showing data results. So I want to take you on a tour of the file structure, just so you can understand what's going on underneath the scenes. There we go. Can everybody read it OK? Do I need to zoom the font at all? So used to doing this in person, I'm like, OK, I have to zoom. I forget we're all in browsers at this point. But if you do need me to, to zoom anything up, please let me know. So I am at notebooks.azure.com. I am logged in as myself. And what we're looking at right now is the project for tonight's demos and presentation. So this is the file structure that I have. So I am working in, a, in this folder. I'm going to go under Project Settings. And you can see that I've made this a public project. So I am going to go to Share. I'm going to copy this link. I am going to paste it in group chat for those following along here. I will also post it in Twitch. So for any of you who want to follow along, you can clone this. You'll notice that this interface is similar to GitHub. There's a clone button. So you can click clone and figure out what you want to clone. 
No, this is me cloning my own project. I can't really do that. I'm not going to clone a new project. Um, but if you want to make a clone of this and make it public, you can check that public checkbox and go along that way as well. But cloning this will give you your own copy of this presentation and all these files to work with. Now, some of the other things you'll see here in this file structure. So there are these IPyNB files. Those are the IPython notebook files. This is what Jupyter uses for the notebooks themselves. I have a readme.md, similar to a Git repository. Talk about what your repo is about. You can see that I've left here some links of some of my favorite sites and references, but they are also on the slide deck as well. My Animal Crossing and Ramen Ratings demos. Those are what the other two IPynB files are. I have a data folder. I try to keep things organized at least in a way that not everything's all in one folder. That gets to be overwhelming. And so I put all my CSVs in here. Now, CSVs I use that for user group demos because they're quick and easy to import. But you could do this for scraping websites. You can do this for remote uh, sources as well. I'm going to go up a folder. So using the breadcrumbs up at the top, I'm going to go ahead and click on Louisville Azure 2020.0625. There's the images folder. And you can see in here then the various images that I use as well. So when I talk about ramen, sometimes I'll do a promo ahead of time and say, okay, these are the different types of ramen. Does the type of ramen make a difference? So you guys can see, I'm not crazy when I mentioned that there's a ramen chocolate bar. It's a thing. So we have a file structure that allows us to kind of corral things. I didn't put the notebooks in the notebooks folder just because in this case, it was fine for me to keep them in root. I could if I really wanted to. The organization of the files is up to you. Ultimately, you're the one who's using these things. If you're working in a team, whoever sets the guidelines for that will tell you how you want to organize this. Um, some other things to note in this file system uh, screen. Right now, I am running on free compute. Um, there's, because I am running currently, I'm not going to shut it down. But at the end of this presentation, I will show you what it's like to shut it down. And I will show you the other option for free compute. So there's free compute, and then there's the other compute option as well. And again, Microsoft Azure Notebooks is in a public preview. It's been in preview for a while. We don't know when it's officially going to be non-preview, um, but they do have some limitations. And that link, where is it? Azure Notebooks here, um, does include a link to their limitations. OK. I would say I have no tricks up my sleeves, but today I'm actually not wearing sleeves. All right, so why Azure Notebooks? And we took a look at the file structure. Now, as I mentioned, this presentation is a PowerPoint uh, slideshow. This was the one labeled why Azure Notebooks .ipynb. And I'm going to go ahead and click the down arrow. So the presentation, I'm using Rise Slideshow as the presentation for this. Microsoft has a great walkthrough as to how RISE works and how you set up the various slides for your presentation. So I made sure to include a link. Now RISE, for those of you who are used to web development and presentations, RISE uses Reveal.js under the coverage. So to give you an idea of being able to click up and down and not just side by side, that's what's going on there. All right. Let's take a look at this in the Azure Notebook side of things. So I'm going back to the file system. And the presentation that I'm showing you, I'm running it in a browser in full screen mode. So that's why you don't see a lot of the things that you would normally see up top, um, just so that we have more screen real estate for the slides. All right, so notebooks.azure.com, I'm in my project. It's the far right, much like Jupyter, there's that new. I'm going to do a new notebook. Now, Christopher had asked about F Sharp. This is where you're going to see F Sharp. 
Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to play with F sharp, so it would be very lost if I started in there. Excuse me. But you're more than welcome to check out the F sharp side. There's also an R kernel in Azure Notebooks, as well as a 3.6, a 3.5, and a 2.7 Python kernel. Now, I have to clarify the Python 2.7 because when I see it, I, I get a little sad that it's still there. Python 2.7 is a language line. Um, it's a dead language line. So Python 2x and Python 3x, there were some breaking changes going up to 3x. It took a while for people to move up to the new line. Not everybody moves. Some people are still in 2.7 land. But the Python team, the Python maintainers, have come out and said there are no more updates. They knew that they were going to sunset the language in 2020, and they knew they were going to do one more update in April 2020. Well, here we are now in June of 2020, almost July. That last update did happen in April. So Python 2.7 is a dead line. If there's any more vulnerabilities, they will not be fixing them. So try not to be in the 2.7 line. Try to be in the Python 3 line if you can. I'm going to go ahead and create the Python 3.6. Now, unlike what you saw in the last example, when I was running Jupyter locally, I could just put in a file name. And here, I need to type in the name plus the file extension. So I'm going to say Louisville Azure Demo ipy nb. Now you'll see that it created the file here in the file system. So if I click on that, Louisville Azure Demo .ipymb link. Now we're in our created notebook. And then this just picks right back up for the Jupyter Notebook demo, where we have the interactivity. We have the kernel in the upper right corner. I'm specifically using Python 3.6. So it looks like it's hidden under my picture in the um, Twitch stream. But trust me when I say that that Python 3.6 is really there. And the Python logo is also in the upper right corner. Or I can toggle that out and shrink it down. Just so you can see, there's the Python logo and there's a Python 3.6. And yes, that's Legos in my background. I am a Legos person. I can't help it. Always have been. And my husband and my boys are very much into Legos as well. Now, this is we've taken a look at Python. We saw the interactivity. We saw the import this. So I'm going to do uh, Shift Enter. I'm going to do the import this. I'm in Azure Notebooks, so it's not going to be a problem. But now let's say that I want to show something with this. So maybe I want to say, so I'm going to insert a cell above. I'm going to go ahead and maximize this. We have the screen real estate again. OK. Now let's talk about code and markdown cells. So I know right now I'm in a code cell. Do you remember what I said was one of the giveaways for a code cell? Did I hear somebody say the input prompt? This in with the square brackets? That it is. This is how I know that I'm in a code cell. There's another way, though, too. So there's this drop down. So we have the shortcuts toolbar with like a save and an insert and cutting the cells, copy. There's this drop down here that says code. I can go ahead and I can change that to markdown. How do I know I'm in markdown? The in prompt goes away. So then I can press enter to activate the cell. How do I know that the cell is active? Blinking cursor is one of the giveaways. The other is that the border around the selected cell went from blue to green. So there are a couple visual indicators that it's interactive. And I'm going to type in here. So this is Louisville Azure Demo. So we have that.
Now, another thing I could do is I could say, you know what, I actually want to change this to code. I could press Y. Why is the keyboard shortcut to turn that from markdown to code? Why is it Y? That happened to be what they chose. I press escape to get out of edit mode, but leave it selected. I can press M to turn it back to markdown. Now you don't have to memorize the keyboard shortcuts either. If you come up under help, there is all sorts of references in here. So there's the language reference, there are various common science and mathematical libraries, NumPy, SciPy, uh, Matplotlib, and Pandas are the ones I use the most. But then there's also keyboard shortcuts. Now of the keyboard shortcuts, the ones I use the most are switching between code and markdown. So markdown is M, that one. on here. Uh, and code is Y. Then there's also, you'll hear me talk about control enter and shift enter. Alt enter is also a thing as well. Alt enters run cell and insert below. But my shift enter does run cell and select below, which gets me there as well. But if you're a keyboard user, these keyboard short, shortcuts will make it a lot easier for you to go and uh, navigate through, which makes my life a lot easier. Honestly, I'm more of a keyboard user than I am a mouse. Now, the other thing you'll see here is this enter and exit ride slideshow. So I can turn this into a slideshow. Now you're wondering, how do I set these as slides? Well, there's a trick to that. So come up to view, and then I'm going to come to the cell toolbar. And under the cell toolbar, there's an option for slideshow. Now, when I do that, you'll see that this dropdown appears for each and every one of the cells. Do I want to make it a slide, a subslide, a fragment? Do I want to skip it? Do I, do I want it to be notes? That's where looking at that Microsoft documentation on how to do the Rise Slideshow comes into play, because they explain how that flow works. All right. Any questions so far? Nope. OK. Chad, with the user group, do you normally give a, a break in the middle, like a five, 10 minute bathroom break? No, usually not. OK. Well, then we will keep going. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and close this. And we're going to go back to our presentation. And we'll go back into full screen. All right. So you're able to create a new notebook. Oh, wait, there's one more thing I wanted to show you. So I've been showing you Python all along. I should show you that there are other kernels as well. I'm going to do a new notebook. I'm going to make it an R1, and we'll call it uh, Louisville Azure R demo dot ipynb. New, and we'll click on that, and I will. Unfull screen this again so you can see that I have my R kernel and see that right below the name of the notebook, or in this case, that's the name of the project. So there's the R notebook, the R logo. So I could put R code in there. Let me see, pull that over here. I can open up one of my files here and I will copy some R in so you can see how that works too. Um, I'm going to open up this one here. Or it's not going to open today. All right. Well, this is the R. This is what happens with the R kernel. It's, it, you can see those. You can put R code in here. I've been in Python now for the past couple of years. It's been a while since I've touched R. So. You can also do the slideshow for R or any of the other languages. 
this rise slide shows part of the Jupyter code and not part of the kernel. All right, let's, that's fine. Maximize, full screen. Okay. Language support in regards to Azure Notebooks is specifically Python, RNF, Sharp. Um, if you want the other languages, I recommend installing Jupyter locally, or there are also other hosted um, Jupyter Notebooks as well. Now, those of you in Zoom, how many of you are also on Twitch, or at least curious about Twitch? So if you want to learn more about Python on Twitch, I actually have a list of some of the live coders who talk about Python on their streams. Um, so I did a I did this presentation, in a very much condensed version this past weekend, the Live Coders Conference. And so I made sure to include some of them in here. And as I do this presentation for user groups, I always want to mention the Live Coders. It's a great way for you to learn about the language and the developer community as well. Um, BeginBot is probably one of my favorite Python uh, devs to learn from on Twitch because he's doing fun things. He was playing with MIDI files and analyzing MIDI file sequences and like how the notes change and what keys it's working in. It was really cool to see him playing with that. He also will solve a Rubik's Cube on, on the stream in pretty short time. He makes quick, quick work on that. It's pretty awesome. Um, and then another one. So I wasn't really familiar with Mastermind.io. I knew he did some DevOps stuff because that's what he was presenting on. But he also does Python in his stream. And I happened to catch him at just the right time that he was singing Baby Shark. And so I was like, okay, he's doing Baby Shark in Python. So I made sure to include a link to his repo of the, the Baby Shark in Python. Um, but he has fun with his stream. So I, I call out streamers that I know have fun with this. Uh, Ninjayo, that's Nina Zakarenko. And she does Python, but she also does you know, the IoT, the Internet of Things. And she does things with light up circuit boards and wearable stuff, wearable LEDs and things that are all programmable with Python. So they have fun. So it's always like, make sure you check out their streams. Okay. Now note taking in Jupyter, like I mentioned, I use this when I was going through data camp. Um, I've used this, so there was a, a speaker, Matthew Renzi, he talks about R and he talks about AI and ML, if you ever catch him. Um, he did a R workshop and I used Jupyter Notebooks to take notes for his session as well. Um, but it's nice because they're using like math, science, language support. Um, how many of you are familiar with math equations and maybe have to work with them in notes? Oh, Euler. <laughs> Euler. Project Euler is a good one. So yeah, these equations. You can use those math syntax like that with the, the, the fancy math font. Um, it's supported by a library called MathJax, both for Project Jupyter and here in, in the Azure Notebook side. So the Azure Notebook side, you can't do the custom kernels, but they do have a lot of the support that you're seeing. Um, and so MathJax, if you're not sure about doing math formatting, rest assured, when I created this slide, I actually had to go to this URL here to learn more about how to do the LaTeX thing. I don't do LaTeX in Markdown that often, but this page here with the working with Markdown cells makes it so much easier. All right, and Markdown support. As you've been seeing, I was editing the cells as I was doing this presentation. There's Markdown support under the cover. You can also embed HTML as well. So if I double click on this, you're going to see that I have a mix of Markdown and HTML. And I'm using the old school table layouts. It's easier for me to do the tables in HTML than it is to do the Markdown for it. I, I can do the Markdown if I have to, but, but it's a good mix of, of that. Now, are any of you fans of hats? Any of you wear hats? I'm not much of a hats person. Are you familiar with Jeff Fritz of the C-sharp world? So you'll know that Mr. Fritz has a thing for hats. He's a live streamer. He is on Twitch as C-sharp Fritz. And his streams are awesome to check because you're always curious to see what hat is Jeff wearing today? 
So when I did this presentation for the live coders, I had to make sure to clarify that these hats I'm about to show you are not Jeff's hats. But you'll see hats like these from Instafluff, that's this guy here, and Fierce Kittens, Chef Brent, Brent Schooley, and Newt Cat. So they, they run these streams on Twitch. And some of them play this game. Uh, any of you Animal Crossing fans? Uh, see, I have friends who are hooked on Animal Crossing, and they've been trying to get me to play, and I'm like, guys, I have work to do. I can't play right now. And I have a feeling it'll suck me in eventually. The more I do this presentation, the more I'm like, nope, not yet. Nope, not yet. Maybe soon. OK. So these are the hats I'm talking about. These are not the hats that appear on Jeff Fritz's stream. So I'd be curious to see what he looks like with this. What is this called? A fox mask? So yeah, these are some of the money hats. Here, I'll zoom in so you can see. There are lots and lots of hats in Animal Crossing. It's a thing. Now, there's a so one of the sites I use for finding data is called Kaggle, K A G G L E dot com. And there's a uh, Animal Crossing data set there. And so I was like, OK, we'll see what it has. And so what's neat is seeing under the covers what some of the things were that they have in terms of hats. So if I look under the covers, you can see that there's a lot of divs. And I'm going to zoom this back, control 0 to full screen, regular. So you can see there's a lot of repetition with the divs. Well, I'm a developer. I became a developer because a part of me is lazy. I don't want to have to keep writing this stuff over and over. I have a for loop do it for me. I like when my code writes my code. I'm going to go ahead and shift enter out of that. So yeah, there are quite a few hats here. I'm going to go ahead and go down the slide. You can see this is the for loop I use to generate the hats. So I basically went through a, cat, uh, a items list and looped through it. I want to go back and show you the Kaggle data set. So I'm going to come back to the up arrows and down arrow keyboard shortcuts don't seem to work. So let's do this. I'm going to open a new tab. And I'm going to on full screen. So I can get my toolbar. I'm going to go to Kaggle.com so you can see what this looks like. So this is one of my favorite sites for data sets because this is where I find some of the fun data sets. It sets out like to present to user groups and to people who are like, hey, Sarah, how do I do this cool thing in, in data science? I'm like, hold on. So I can come here. So they have Compete. So they have a competition. I haven't really looked into it. There's data sets, there are notebooks, which is their take on Jupyter notebooks. There's discussion, and then there's courses. And I'm going to take it to data sets. And I'm going to do a search. And I'm going to do a search for Animal Crossing. And press Enter. If I scroll, you can see there's Animal Crossing reviews. It's about two months old. And the Animal Crossing New Horizons in the Plaza catalog. And that's a month old. So it tells you how long the data set's been out there. It tells you the size of the data set. You can see the rating of the data set. And you can see the number of files and the tasks. So let's take a look and see what that means. I'm going to click Animal Crossing Reviews because this is the one I used to generate all of those hats. And what's nice about this website is that so it's got a description. You need to usually include things like acknowledge, acknowledgments. Where did your data come from? In this particular one, they talk about Tidy Tuesday and Tidy Data. Tidy Data has to deal with cleaning up the data you've had, making it so it's actually presentable for others. Now, this data set has four different CSVs. It has critic, items, user reviews, and villagers. The hats came from items. So if I click on item, on the right hand side here, then you can see now I'm looking at items.csv. It's 653 K. You can see the various headings. This particular data set, they were very nice to explain not only the field names, 
like give some details behind it. I say very nice because some people will just toss a data set out there. They don't even label the columns. They put spaces in their columns. They do other bad things that we just go, why? And so you can see here various like samples of the data. You can say, I don't want a, a detailed version. You can choose your columns and say, you know, I want to select them. No, I don't want to select them all. Maybe I want to see like what is buy value and what is sell value and what are name and category, how it apply. So Kaggle allows you to take a look at data. You can explore it here. You can create a notebook from here. That's what the new notebook is. And then there's download. And I've downloaded this. And I've included items and villagers as part of the project for Azure Notebooks. So that way you have an idea of where this data actually came from. Now I have actually included my own data as part of Kaggle. So if I do a search for Sudoku sensors, just so you're aware, I tried to make it so that this was usable. It's 115 meg, because there's just a few data points there, 2.3 million. Chad, that's just a few, right? Once we hit a million, okay. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Christopher, for coming. So you can see there's 2.3 million records, and I promise you that it's not clean. So if you want to play with data, this is a good data set to look at. We have temperature sensors and humidity sensors scattered throughout our house. My husband has a thing for IoT and Raspberry Pis and tracking everything, all the things, um, taking care of plants and learning how to automate the watering of those plants. So we've got sensors all over for this. This is the sensor data that you can see. Okay, are any of the sensors, do they run hot? Do they run cold? We actually use, to, use this to figure out. So my office is at the other end of the house from everything else. All the kids' bedrooms and toy room and kitchen and stuff, they're at the other end of the house. They all get the air conditioning. They all get the heat. My office, I get the heat when it's summertime. I get the cold when it's wintertime. Also known as it, I don't think I'm really connected to the system very well. But we use this data to see where did my office sit sensor-wise. So Kaggle allows you, as a community member, you can contribute your own data. You can contribute data from wherever you want, as long as you have the right licensing or acknowledgments behind. OK. That's where Animal Crossing came from, my Animal Crossing slides. I do have an Animal Crossing notebook as well. And I'm going to go ahead and click on my link. This is the Animal Crossing notebook that I have for the user group project. Now I want to talk about pandas while we're talking about Animal Crossing. I don't believe there are pandas in Animal Crossing. I know there are pandas in Minecraft, but I don't know if there are any in Animal Crossing. But what I can do with this is I use this to import data, to manipulate it, to generate visualizations as well. So I grabbed that CSV from Kaggle, downloaded it locally, and then uploaded it to Azure Notebooks. We're still in Azure Notebooks, you can tell, because of right up here, it says Microsoft Azure Notebooks Preview. And because I'm not in full screen, you can actually see the URL. Um, but for this particular notebook, I just went straight into code. I didn't really get into the markdown behind it. Pandas will allow me to read the CSV and manipulate things, as we're about to see. So I read everything in the CSV and I stored it in this variable called items. This items is a data set. The data structure behind it is called a data frame. And it has all these columns. So all the columns you saw in the CSV are attached to the rows and the rows and columns translate over to this data frame. For line two, I call a head. Head basically will give you the first five records of your data set. Or you can pass a value over to it and say, I want X amount of records. When I get a data set I'm not familiar with, I typically try to start with five. If I can go 10, I'll go 10 to just get more details of, OK, what am I working with? <coughs> and so I can see here that I've got like not a numbers and Boolean. So keep an eye out for that kind of stuff. Then I use that info 
And uh, info allows us to see not only the column name, but I can see how many not null observations are in there. By knowing, so there are, up at the top, it says range index, there's 4,565 entries. That means there's 4,565 rows. The non-null tells you where the data is. So that orderable column only has 1,790 non-null, which means that there's going to be quite a bit of null data in there. And then there's also the data type. So you can see that in an object float, Things like that. So info gives you a good idea of the structure of the data. So if it's not documented well, wherever you get it, this will help with that. Now this is, oh, this notebook didn't get updated. So this will actually generate a, um, a bar graph. What it's doing here is it's looking at the categories that these items are classified in as. And then it was for each of those categories, it was getting how many rows belong to this category. Then we were sorting it. And then I was only getting the top 10 categories. And that was just to get an idea of what kind of categories I was working with. Furniture was the top one. And that's also where I saw hats, hence the hats thing from earlier. Now, as I mentioned, I don't play the game, so I have a lot to learn. So you're going to see that I did things like, OK, what are the currency things that you can use for buying items in game. Apparently you can use bells and you can use miles. And then there's of course, man, not a number. So I was like miles. Okay, bells I've heard of. My my friends keep telling me that that's the common currency. Okay, fine. But miles? I've never heard of miles as a currency. What's that about? Well there's apparently a store that deals with this Nook Inc stuff that takes miles. So I was like, okay, give me an idea of what's in there. And I just had to give me every column. Then I decided, okay, let's generate a graph, get a, a, an idea of the buy values and how are they spread out. So then I generated a histogram. And you can see that there's things that are they're not necessarily free. And then a thousand dollars or a thousand buy values that are less than two thousand five hundred. Thousand dollars is a sweet spot. And then it kind of tapers back off again. And I was like, okay, I've seen the beginning. I've seen some of the sampling data sets. What's at the end of the furniture data set? What kind of furniture do we have in this game? Dot tail. So dot head starts at the top and gets the first five if you don't pass, by the pass in a variable. Tail does the last five. But like head, you can also say I only the last 10, the last 15, whatever your number is. You can put that in here. Let's say, give me three. Oh, because I didn't. So I loaded a notebook that already had the output displayed. And so I didn't rerun the cells. If I rerun the cells, so I can come up to cell, all output, clear the output. You can see all the code straight as is. And if I tell it so, run all. And our tail three should come back with just the last three items. While this is running, any questions? Some no's. There it goes. Like I said, being in the public preview is a little bit slower. The graphs may take a little bit. So we're going to go back to the presentation. We can come back to this later. I'll just show you where. This particular message here, so what happens when it renders the, the bar graphs and plots and stuff, depending on the library and the configuration, it may try to render them in a separate window. And so sometimes it gets hung up with that. So, and that's a simple command, but I want to let that kernel run the rest of its lines before putting that command in. All right. So another data set I like to use is the Raman Raider. So the Raman Raider is also on Kaggle. 
Do any of you like to eat ramen? Yeah. If I grew up eating Marachan ramen. So I'd go to the local retail chain and they had these packs of ramen. They were maybe, what, 10 cents each at the time? Not so much nowadays, but loved eating Marachan ramen. That was about all I knew. Uh, once I married my husband, he's half Chinese. My last name does not give that away. His mom's side, he's Chinese. Um, yeah, I know people will always see Dukevich and they're like, wait, you're married to a guy who's part Chinese? I'm like, his mom's side, not his Polish side. I probably, the last name is very confusing when you hear Chinese. It's very Polish. Um, but he introduced me to all sorts of other noodles and all sorts of other brands and stuff. And then when I saw this on Kaggle, I was like, okay, the Ramen Raider, what's this about? So the ramenraider.com is the website. And somebody actually went through all of his reviews and aggregated it into a set that we could use it in. And so we can see various things such as brands and varieties, styles, countries, things like that. Uh, you can see the various star ratings. Uh, I'm going to maximize the view so you can actually see that. So the maximize view feature in Kaggle is nice too because then it'll expand the data when it can. So you can see the various different fields that are out there. And so one of the questions I had when I was looking at this is, okay, first of all, how many brands are there? There's 355 brands in this set. Um, unique ones, I should say. For the variety, I was just more curious as to, okay, what kind of variety? What are the flavors there? And then the thing that really stuck with me was, okay, there's different styles of ramen. I am used to those packets with the packet seasoning that you can just cook on the stove or I cook it in the microwave over the weekend. Um, so you can do those, but what else is there? Oh, well, there's bowls, there's uh, it? cups, bowls, and various other things. And I'll go ahead and show you what those look like. So packs, bowls, cups, trays, boxes. There's also bar and can. I'll show you if I do a filter here for bar. I showed you a picture of the ramen chocolate bar. Comfort chocolates, savory ramen bar. And he rated it five stars. Now, can was another option in there. And I was like, a can of ramen? Campbell's soup ramen style? I don't know. I got nothing. And so I looked at the data some more and then said, said, okay, what is this can of ramen that he rated? Curious. It's potato crisps or potato chips for those of us here in the States. It's like potato crisps, but it was not only that, it was Pringles potato crisps. So, okay, but it only got a three and a half stars. So it really wasn't all that in a bag of chips. Or in this case, all that in a bag, a can of chips. Didn't really take well with the ratings. Now you're probably wondering, how did I know to even look for the bar and even look for the can? Well, I was curious if that style made a difference with the ratings. So I did a box plot. I'll come back to the presentation so you can see where that box plot is. Let me see if it's going to let me zoom in a bit. So this is the box plot I created, and it's in the ramen ratings Azure notebook that's included in the project. But I was just like, okay, does the style make a difference? Well, you can see that for fairly familiar delivery styles, like cup, pack, tray, and bowl style, eh, you've got some less than ones, but for the most part, they're three to four. So ramen in a fairly standard thing that we recognize is fine. But then I saw that the box has an outlier here, and then it has most of it is between uh, like four and a half and five. And then I saw can and I saw bar, and that's when I got suspicious. I was like, okay, what are these single lines and what do they do? And that's how I found out that there was the Pringles can and the comfort chocolate bar. We'll take a look at this. So if we go back to our file structure and go to ramenratings.ipymb, you can see what I did with that as well. Now I have a notebook shared in Kaggle for this because that's where the data set happened to exist. 
but I was able to bring all the code over and put it into a Jupyter notebook just fine. You can see it's running Python 3.6. And these cells are already run. So I'm just gonna scroll through so you can see some things that I've done. So in this line seven, you'll notice that I have a percent matplotlib in line. That's telling the, the renderer under the covers to keep this bar with the notebook. So that way it doesn't have any problems rendering the graph itself. And you can see that Nissen has a lot of different ramen in the ratings. Nissen by a long shot. But then there's a few others like Nongshim and Marachan. And I was curious about the brand distribution. I wanted to see the top 10 brands that are represented. And I stored it in a variable called brand underscore distribution. Something to note, there's that in prompt with the square brackets in eight, but there's no out. As I mentioned, there's not always going to be an output. So don't panic if you don't see an out. Chances are whatever you put in there code wise doesn't actually have output. Then I decided to take that brand distribution and turn it into a plot because yeah, I could look at the data frame, but I would rather be able to see it in a visual. Now, these plots, I'm just using pandas and pandas under the covers uses something called matplotlib. So to give you an idea of what libraries we're working with here. How do I know that it uses matplotlib? Well, if we saw back in the other notebook where we were having issues with the Animal Crossing, You'll see here that matplotlib is building the font cache and that used plot. Uh, and years ago when I first started doing visualizations, it was a message similar to this one where matplotlib was doing things. I was like, oh, how do I solve this problem? So again, when you wanna display graphs and charts and such within your notebook, use that percent matplotlib in line for when you're working with pandas. When you're working with matplotlib.pyplot, it seems to stay in its window like it's supposed to. And then this is where I started looking at the style and the variety, looking at unique values for that. And I cleaned up some of the data because I wanted to get rid of anything that had not availables, not numbers. And you can see I was looking at various things like, okay, show me where the style is equal to cup. So you can put the expression to filter right within the square brackets. So the ramen ratings, I read all the ratings from the CSV and I just filter it down. It's nice you can put a filter in like that. Wanted to see what countries are represented. Surprisingly, Japan had the most five-star rated ramen. I wanted to see the stars, like what the ratings are for that. I was able to use a histogram to see how that spread looks. Now, there's a library out there called Seaborn. And what I like about Seaborn is it makes graphs go from what we see up here at the top, the star rating counts and Roman ratings. That's done at matplotlib. Seaborn makes it a little more smoother. And this is going to be your preference as to what you like for styles and such. There's also, I had a kernel density chart example. There's my box plot. So the picture that you saw in the presentation, this is the actual how I made it. I did the percent matplotlib in line because I'm using matplotlib to still generate some of the visuals, but then I'm using Seaborn to create the box plot and make it pretty. And then this is where I was like, okay, what is this can? What is this bar? You can see that I filtered it down to style double equal bar, style double equal can. Does it need to see how this works under the covers? Like I said, there are no tricks up my sleeves. But I like this. Okay, let's come back to the presentation. So then of course I wanted to show some cool things with Animal Crossing and how I explored Animal Crossing as well. And again, this goes back to using pandas and looking at the, the data to see an idea of what's going on. So using tail. What's nice with this is I actually filtered it out. And yes, you see me highlighting in there. I'm in a code cell in the presentation on the slide. 
Um, but I'm not going to run it at this point. Just doing this so you can see what this looks like. And yes, as I hover over the different cells, it highlights the selected cell. So it makes it easy. If I want to know how many rows I have, I can call len on the data frame. So that's how I also can find out easily. This is the one I tried to generate earlier that was giving us uh, some fits. And so when I added the percent net plot lib in line, that kept the, the graph in here. So you could see that furniture was super high in the categories. Hats happened to be in this list as well. Now, my friends who play this were like, Sarah, we have a question. I'm like, oh, no. First of all, they're ones who deal with me in real life if they're getting away calling me Sarah. Not all of them have adjusted to Sudoku yet. We're getting them together. But uh, they're just like, we want to know, since you have by value and sell value, is there a relation between them? And I'm like, OK, let's take a look and see. And so I created a scatter plot to see the by value and sell value for furniture, because that was the most populated. And I looked at that, and I'm like, well, that looks like a fairly linear relation there, going on an angle like that. And then I was like, this guy's pretty high. Let's take a look at a different category, and let's filter things down. So what I did here, what it looks like I forgot to do. <laughs> so I filtered it down. I only wanted to see the wallpaper. And this example shows that you can have multiple conditions in your filter. So in my items data, fr data frame, only show me those that are category wallpaper with a cell value of less than 1,000, because we saw the cell value spike at 1,000. I want to create a scatter plot, show me cell value versus by value and then give the chart a title. In this case, this is what happens sometimes when data science goes bad, is you have a bad title. So your data shows one thing, but the title says something different. This is actually the relations between wallpaper buy and sell, not hats. I'm not going to run that because I didn't run the initial items in here. But there is definitely a relationship there between the buy and sell value. And I tried this for other categories as well. I was curious to see. And there's definitely a linear relation there. Now, if you do play Animal Crossings, day-to-day um, -day prices do change. You want to check the stock market. Yes, the stock, S-T-A-L-K market, not the stock market, the stock market with Sal Jones. No, not Dow Jones, Sal Jones. Uh, and then there's Daisy May. No, not Fannie Mae, but Daisy May. So they, they ran with that one a lot in, in Animal Crossing. So check the Sow Jones for the daily prices. OK. Getting toward the end here, I want to show you some of my favorite data sets. That way, if you want to play around with this, you can. Kaggle, hands down, my favorite data set site just because it's, it's organized. And people who uh, contribute from the community do a really good job of doing that. Data.gov, so I used to host a hackathon at NASA Glen, and we did a lot of hacking with like weather and climate and ecosystem and some space stuff. And data.gov happens to have a ton of data sets to play around with. So you want to understand more about, well, let me show you what it's all about. If you want to do things such as COVID, they have coronavirus.gov, but you can do things like show me, um, Show me ocean, do a search for ocean. Various data sets, and then I can come over to the left and I can filter on, I only want to see climate. And then I can say, I only want to see ecosystem. So you can drill down and, and see the various data sets. You'll see some are in HTML. So that would be good for an example of, of doing like screen, screen scraping with a tool called Beautiful Soup, if you're in Python world. Um, but you can also then say, I want maybe geospatial data or I want non-geospatial. There's a lot of different ways you can filter stuff on data.gov. NASA.data.gov is what NASA used to use. Um, that has since changed. If you do a search for NASA open data, that will get you their links. And they do a hackathon. Uh, it's in October. So if you want to ever hack on space solutions, check out International Space Apps Challenge. Uh, it's spaceappschallenge.org. Blender is another notebook hosting site, and they have plenty of links to open data there. 
Uh, AWS Data Exchange for the Amazon folks. New York City's open data. If you do a search for whatever locale you're looking for in open data, um, the phrase open data, and I use that with quotes for those who may not see that video. Um, it's so that you understand that that phrase open data is a thing. New York City is huge with sharing their data. Knowledge Domo, I encountered this one very late before the presentation. So I don't really have cool examples to show from it. But when you have things such as Jeopardy questions, they're like, okay, what? Or wine reviews, or the Olympic history. These are fun topics to explore. There's all sorts of different things here. So I've included a link to there as well. If you're looking for other data sets and you're not sure where to start, feel free to reach out to me. I am Saduki on Twitter. I am Saduki on LinkedIn. And I will gladly help you find data sets. Finding data is what I do. I'm a data whisperer. It whispers to me, hey, Sarah, you should check out this cool data set. Hey, Sarah, check out this one. This one's kind of dirty, so you got to tidy it up. And once you get to the data cleansing part, it's all good. So if data talks to me, I can probably find a source for it. I swear I was probably a librarian in a past life because of how much I can locate these things. Oh, yeah. This reminder. Shut down. This is a, an explicit reminder to shut down these notebooks. So I'm going to go ahead and close my ramen ratings tab. And I'm going to come over to my file system. And you will see that I have things here, these various notebooks. I'm going to come over to my ramen ratings. Notice that there's a button here for shutdown. Shut this down. Do I want to shut down this project? I'm going to tell it to shut down the whole project. So when I tell it that, rest assured, I don't get this connected from Zoom. This is just for the notebooks. So the file system, I can still see. If I come in here to the YS notebooks so where the presentation is, you can see that I've shut it down. Now, why would I shut it down? Because I'm working in cloud resources. How many of you have worked with cloud resources, forgot you were in the cloud, left something connected, and then racked up a bill and you were like, oops. It happens. So try to remember to shut down. I'm going to go ahead and tell it to cancel. And I'm going to go ahead and exit rise. And as I mentioned, this presentation tonight is an Azure notebook. Uh, my information is in the Azure notebook. So if you clone it, that's the best way to get a hold of me. I will paste these also into our Zoom chat and our uh, Twitch chat. That way, if you need to get a hold of me, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I just got here. Could you do it all again? Oh man, Doug! <laughs> no, you know? I'll, just, I'll, I'll, I'll just wait. I'll just wait till next month. <laughs> July twentieth. I'll be speaking yeah. for the Memphis crew. And at that point, this this talk will probably evolve a little bit more, and there will be more slides and more probably references to fun data sets. So. Yeah. The troublemaker, I swear. You know? Hey, we 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 were we were just talking about how much of a troublemaker it is, you know. <laughs> Who says hi by the way? Ed as in Charbonneau? Yes. Yeah, I had hi. him I had him I had him for the for, for my .NET group tonight. That's awesome. If you ever want Blazor resources, that's mm -hmm. Ed's the go to guy. That's yep. He, that's what he did. He blazed. He blazed us. He blazed us out. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Oh, Ed's great. Love it. Yeah. Oh, Alex, <laughs> Mike, you're welcome, guys. <laughs> nice catch, Alex. <laughs> Call me Suzuki. <laughs> uh, Doug, you missed it. We had so I told the story of why I'm Suzuki. And then how we go to conferences, and if you see me in the hallways and call me Sarah, I may end up ignoring you. I may not end up hearing you. But if you call me Saduki, I am guaranteed to respond. <laughs> so I probably asked you this before, but I'm going to ask you again. How do you pronounce your last name? Dukavich. Dukavich. Okay. Yep. Yep. Dukavich. And if, if you guys ever have me out and don't know how to say it, just ask. 
I always okay. send a pronunciation guide, or usually send it. I don't think I did it for the past couple user groups. But if you ask for it, I will gladly give that. Because that last name is a mess. <laughs> just to do, to Polish, do. right? It is Polish. My husband yeah, is half yeah. Polish and half Chinese. Because there's a, yeah, because there's a composer named Krzysztof Pendrytski. And it's and it's got a lot of the same same mm -hmm. mouths and such. Yeah, he's Polish. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It's, I worked with a lady. Her last name was Ditchkevich, so she oh. had an extra CZ in there. And I was like, "Hey, that's awesome." She's like, "How did you pronounce that?" I'm like, uh, "I'm married to a guy who's part Polish, so I kind of <laughs> learned how to pronounce Polish last names. I'm part Slovak, so Slovak Polish. The languages there's a lot of similarities enough that I can pick it up." <laughs> awesome. Oh, Sudoku, that was awesome. I mean, I, I, I know there weren't many questions, although I bet you there'll be questions once I stop the stream. That, that's oh. normally what happens. Well, once, uh, you, once you stop the stream, I'll still be here. I'm here to hang out. <laughs>